Good morning. It's Thursday, the 9th of January. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast here, coming to you from Arirang's news center in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. The Korean victims of the Japanese military's wartime sexual slavery mark the 22nd anniversary of holding weekly rallies in Seoul. The women continue to demand a sincere apology from Japan. Despite strong objections from Korea and China, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says visiting the controversial Yasukuni War Shrine is part of his role and responsibility as Prime Minister. Plus, the surge of polar temperatures across North Korea is making its way down to the southern United States, causing mercury levels to dip far below seasonal norms. Wednesday marked the 22nd year since weekly demonstrations began in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul over the still unresolved issue of Japan's use of sexual slaves during World War II. Surviving victims continue to call on J Tokyo to acknowledge its war crimes and offer legal compensation. Kim Yanji reports on the ongoing demand for justice. On Wednesday, two surviving victims of sexual enslavement by the Japanese military during World War II stood across from the Japanese embassy in Seoul, as they've done so many times in the past, along with human rights activists and civic groups. For the last 22 years, those coerced into sexual slavery for the Japanese military have held a demonstration every Wednesday, which makes it the longest rally ever in the world. The group has demanded Japan fully admit to and reveal the truth about its war crimes, offer an official apology and legal reparations, punish those responsible for the crimes, accurately report on the crimes in history textbooks, and build memorials and museums in remembrance of the victims. However, the victims, also known as former comfort women, feel Japan has not accepted any of their demands. Japanese politicians continue to make comments that defame the victims and distort history. Among the 237 Koreans recognized by the government as victims of sexual slavery under the Japanese military, only 56 of them are alive today. Meanwhile, Korea and Japan are engaged in a battle in cyberspace over a copper women memorial that was set up in a park near the Glendale Public Library in California last July. The Glendale Memorial is a replica of this one installed directly across the street from the Japanese embassy in Seoul, which depicts a girl dressed in traditional Korean clothing. The White House says a netizen submitted an online petition last week seeking protection for the Glendale statue. This petition was filed in protest of another petition submitted last month that asked authorities to remove the Copper Woman Memorial in Glendale. About 120,000 people signed the petition demanding its removal, whereas the one seeking protection for the memorial had about 3,000 signatures as of Tuesday morning, local time. The White House's policy is to respond to a petition that has received 100,000 signatures or more within 30 days after being submitted. Kim Yeonji, Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has sought to address the barrage of international criticism that, he is, that has come his way over his recent visit to the controversial Yasukuni War Shrine, saying he will continue fulfilling his responsibility and role as the nation's leader. In an interview with Japanese TV network BS Fuji on Wednesday, Abe said that by visiting the shrine, the hearts of many families of Japan's war dead have been healed. Responding to Washington's official statement expressing its disappointment over his visit to the shrine where Class A war criminals are also honored, Abe said he, would, he could clear up what he called the misunderstanding once he explains his stance to U.S. officials. North Korea has called on the South to handle inter-Korean relations with a proper perspective of security and peace on the peninsula. Pyongyang's Korean Central News Agency reported on Wednesday that escalating tensions on the peninsula are impeding the peaceful reunification of the two Koreas. It then accused the South and the U.S. of creating a, a dangerous situation on the peninsula through their continuous, quote, nuclear war exercises.
against the North. The report added that North Korea would firmly block and destroy any war schemes, whether they come from inside or outside the peninsula. The report comes as Pyongyang remains tight-lipped about Seoul's proposal this week to discuss resuming reunions for families separated since the Korean War. The United States plans to deploy more troops and heavy tanks to South Korea to rebalance its forces across the Asia-Pacific region. The Pentagon said eight, says rather, 800 additional troops along with extra tanks and armored vehicles will start a nine-month deployment on February 1st in Gyeonggi-do province, just south of the demilitarized zone separating the two Koreas. The U.S. already has roughly 28,000 troops stationed here in South Korea. The move comes at a time of heightened tensions on the peninsula, especially after last month's execution of Jang Sung-tek, the once powerful uncle of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. President Park Geun-hye has called for an educational revolution to foster creativity in the nation's young people. Speaking at a New Year's ceremony with members of the education sector, the president said that classrooms should be a place where students develop their dreams and talents, not one in which they, a premium is placed on competition and college admission. President Park vowed to change the nation's education paradigm one step at a time so students are free to be creative and develop their intellects and personalities. On the other side of the political aisle, main opposition Democratic Party leader Kim Han-gil will hold a press conference next Monday to outline his party's policy plans for 2014. Kim's expected to elaborate on the DP's strategy ahead of local elections slated for June. He is also set to use the opportunity to respond to President Park's news conference earlier this week by calling on her to launch a special independent probe into allegations of government agencies meddling in the 2012 presidential election. She rejected the demand in her press conference on Monday. It looks like Dennis Rodman may have finally overstepped the mark. The world is asking whether it was appropriate for the former NBA player to have sung happy birthday to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. This was at an exhibition match Wednesday between the North Korean national team and former NBA stars, which Rodman organized in time for Kim's birthday. This is Rodman's fourth visit to North Korea, whose leader he refers to as a friend for life. The Korean government says the domestic economic recovery is gathering momentum despite lingering global economic uncertainties. In its monthly Green Book report released Wednesday, the finance ministry said major economic indicators like production and investment improved last October and November compared to the third quarter of last year. It also cited stabilizing prices and expanding employment. However, the report also pointed to the weak Japanese yen and the U.S. Federal Reserve's bond-buying stimulus tapering as major uncertainties that could potentially hurt the nation's growth rate in the long run. Over now to Korea's booming medical tourism industry. The health tourism surplus topped 100 million U.S. dollars for the first time ever last year thanks largely to increased spending by overseas travelers seeking health care and medical services in the country. The Bank of Korea says that the country's income for medical tourism was $187 million in the first 11 months of last year, growing more than 35 percent from the same period in 2012. During the same period, however, Koreans overseas spending on medical tourism uh, decreased by more than 11 percent. Korea saw its first surplus in the medical tourism industry in 2011. The Consumer Electronics Show 2014 is in full swing in Las Vegas. Every single company hopes their gadget is going to be the next big thing. And this year, some of the world's biggest automakers are coming along for the ride as they embrace the latest smartphone and mobile computing technology. Ji Myung Gil reports. By embracing smartphone and mobile computing technologies, automakers are beginning to blur the line between our digital and driving lives. 
BMW made a splash at the opening day of this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas by demonstrating a way to control its new i3 electric car using Samsung's Galaxy Gear smartwatch and Bluetooth wireless technology. Using Samsung's Galaxy Gear, you can remotely control the car's temperature, recharge the car battery, and operate the door locks. Mercedes-Benz, not to be outdone, is using the Pebble smartwatch to show off a new way to check up on vehicle conditions. We see the total mileage, we see the tire pressure, so you have full information of your vehicle on your watch. Audi teamed up with Google to bring Android to cars. An Android tablet was designed to provide in-car entertainment such as music and streaming videos. The owner can also search for apps in the Google Play Store. This year, CES is proving that more and more automakers are rushing to make sure there is no disconnect between the gadgets we use each and every day and the vehicles that get us where we're going. Kim young Adirang News. Extreme cold weather in North America and blistering heat waves in South America have been making headlines over the last few days with record-breaking conditions on either end of the temperature scale. Kim Jion takes a look at the extreme weather conditions. Some cities like Milwaukee, St. Louis and Chicago experienced sensory temperatures that dipped to below minus 50 degrees. Around 14 counties in the state of New York declared a state of emergency due to the frigid conditions closing schools and airports. More than 500 passengers taking regular train services in Chicago were left stranded in their compartments for 14 hours when the trains they were traveling in got stuck in ice and snow. Experts attribute the rush of cold air to something called a distorted polar vortex, which is a circulation of strong upper-level winds that normally surround the northern pole in a counterclockwise direction. Normally, a polar low-pressure system keeps the bitter cold air locked in the Arctic regions of the northern hemisphere, but this can become distorted and dip further south, which is what much of the United States is experiencing. But it's a different story on the southern part of the hemisphere, where high pressure is bringing in the heat from the equator, which is leading to extremely hot weather conditions. In the northern part of Argentina, the mercury level shot up to 50 degrees, the highest in the region in a century. At least 10 people have died due to the extreme heat wave there. Some researchers say the Arctic air mass that the U.S. is experiencing could be related to global warming because it coincides with the unusually high temperatures in other regions that are usually cold at this time of the year. Because we've got this very strong westerly jet stream blowing across the U.K., it's tending to, to draw a lot of warm air up from um, the Mediterranean, also from further afield such as the tropical Atlantic. So lots of warm air moving up across Spain, into Italy and into parts of southeastern Europe. The U.S. National Weather Service says it expects this Arctic air mass to continue until Friday. Kim Jian, Adirang News. And this just coming in now, Korea's central bank has left its key interest rate unchanged for the eighth straight month in January at 2.5%. And of course, we'll bring you more details on that in our next newscast, which is coming up at noon Korea time. The improving job market in the United States is what convinced Federal Reserve officials to begin scaling back their bond buying program, according to the minutes of their December policy meeting, which were released on Wednesday. The minutes show that most Fed officials believe the central bank should completely wind down bond buys by the second half of this year. The Fed announced at the end of its December meeting that it would cut its purchases of mortgage bonds and U.S. Treasury bonds from $85 billion a month to $75 billion. Most analysts believe that if the U.S. economy continues to pick up, the Fed will carry on cutting its purchases by $10 billion after each policy meeting in 2014. The total number of smokers in the world is edging ever closer to 1 billion. Data collected from 187 countries shows 967 million people smoked every day compared with 721 million in 1980. Researchers say the rise is linked to population growth as there are simply more people around to take up the habit. The, a separate joint study by the University of Washington and the University of Melbourne shows the smoking rate in Korea is higher than the world average, with 24% of the Korean population regularly lighting up, compared to under 19% of the global average. 
It also found that Korean smokers puff on more cigarettes a day than the world average. 2013 marked a major step forward in space exploration for countries like China, India and Japan. With competition in the global aerospace industry heating up, Korea is planning to launch its own mission to the moon by 2020. Our Paulie reports on how Asia is taking a leading role in the next generation of space missions. This past December, China's first lunar lander safely touched down on the moon's surface along with its companion rover. The successful space mission makes China the third country to complete a soft landing on the moon after the United States and Russia. China plans to return to the moon to build a manned base there by 2030. India has also been advancing its space program. Its first mission to Mars successfully left Earth's orbit last month. The satellite is expected to reach the red planet by mid-September, and India's space agency plans to launch 58 additional space missions over the next four years. Not to be left behind, NASA says it's planning to build a permanent base on the moon by 2025 and also send astronauts to nearby asteroids. In addition, NASA is planning a human mission to the vicinity of the moon, to cislunar space, uh, probably early in the next decade. And this will be very exciting as well because not only will we be visiting the area near the moon, but we will be taking a piece of an asteroid and bringing it back there to show that we can use resources not just from the moon but also from asteroids. Meanwhile, Korea is pushing ahead with its own space exploration program with an early lunar probe set to launch in 2017. The Korea Aerospace Research Institute says its ongoing collaboration with NASA will help train personnel and develop core technologies. Even though we've done a lot of research in guidance control technology, our experience has been limited to low-orbit and geostationary satellites. Therefore, we are working with NASA to address these issues, since they have a great amount of experience in this field. With the full support of the government, Korea's space agency has accelerated its plans to reach the moon by 2020 with an unmanned rover, in search of rare metals and other resources. Paul Yi, Arirang News. A Korean artifact has come home decades after it was stolen during Japan's colonial rule of Korea. Uh, Park ji has more on the return of the 18th century Buddhist tapestry. This grand Buddhist tapestry, which is more than three square meters, is believed to have been made in early 18th century Korea. It shows Buddha giving a sermon to his followers. Experts believe the textile's artistic value lies in the way it depicts Buddha and his followers. Most paintings show Buddha's disciples sitting behind him, but in the tapestry, two disciples sit in front of Buddha, listening attentively as he speaks. Numerous artists have drawn Buddha's disciples, but this tapestry depicts them in a deeply moving way that touches the hearts of viewers. I personally believe that proves that the tapestry has artistic value and should be designated a national treasure. The tapestry was stolen from a Buddhist temple in Korea during Japan's colonial rule in the early 20th century. It was then sold to a famous Japanese art dealer. Later, it was auctioned in New York in 1944 and sold for $450 to a museum in Virginia. The tapestry had been rolled up in a storeroom for some 40 years until the museum turned it over to the Overseas Korean Cultural Heritage Foundation last month. It is currently housed at the National Museum of Korea. The tapestry is one of the many artworks that were taken or stolen during Japan's 35-year colonial rule over the peninsula in the early 20th century. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off with President Park Geun-hye making her visit to the National Training Center in Taenung. Now to mark the 30 days till the start of the Winter Olympics in Sochi, the President visited the training center to meet with the 250 athletes heading over to Sochi next month. 
As a way of boosting their morales before the Olympics, President Park Geun-hye spoke with athletes like figure skater Kim hyun ah and speed skater Lee sang hwa As she stated that she hopes that their hard work will pay off at the Winter Games and will be cheering them on. And moving on with the World Cup in Brazil, less than six months away, manager Hong Myung Bo will be meeting up with PSV's Park Ji Sung one last time to talk about a possible return to the national team. While it's known by practically everyone that Park Ji Sung retired from the national team, no one's really heard it from Park Ji Sung himself. And with the World Cup coming up in June, manager Hong Myung Bo will be meeting up with the former national team captain to see if he can convince him one last time. While Park Ji Sung's father mentioned several times that his son will not be playing for the national team, no one's sure how Park Ji Sung himself feels about a possible return, as fans hope for one last chance for his return. And staying with the South Korean national football team, the KFA has hired a new assistant coach for the upcoming World Cup in Brazil as Tondu Chatine of the Netherlands was added to the coaching staff. The former assistant for Anzi in the Russian Premier League has been added to the coaching staff to assist manager Hong Myung-bo lead the Taeguk Warriors in Brazil. With manager Hong Myung-bo stating that a foreign assistant coach is needed to change up the team's style of football, it was widely speculated that a Dutch coach would be signed. And now moving on to some Wednesday night's KBL action, the Koyang Orions pulled off a win against the Seoul Samsung Thunders with a final score of 78-72. to We won an exciting game between the KT Sonic Boom and the LG Sakers, so let's take a look at the highlights. Now going into the game here, first quarter, KT led by Oh Young Jun's nine points in the quarter, take a 23-16 lead before going into halftime with a comfortable 42-35 lead. In the third quarter of the game, Davon Jefferson tears it up, scoring 24 points in the quarter as LG rallies back to take a slim 66-65 lead going into the fourth quarter. Just a back and forth game from there on, but with Cho Sung Min's clutch three and free throw, the KT Sonic Boom rallied to take this game 87-85 with Cho Sung Min finishing off with 26 points in the game. And finishing things off with some Wednesday night's V-League action, the struggling Hyundai Hill State pulled off an epic five-set win over Daejeon KGC in the Women's League to escape last place. Meanwhile, another last place team looking to move out of their spot as Kepko Vickstorm took on the Samsung Hwajet Blue Fangs. And of course, going into the game here, Leo Martinez puts up 12 points just in the first set with Kepko committing six serve errors as Blue Fangs take the first set 25-22. Now serve errors continue for the Vic Storm as it turns out to be the difference maker here as the Blue Fangs take the next two sets, 25-20 and 25-16, taking this match three sets to nothing. And with the win, the Samsung Hwajet Blue Fangs return to first place. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. And time now to check in on the weather conditions in Korea and around the world.
And that's all for now. Have a fabulous rest of the day, and we do hope to see you back again for our next newscast, which is coming up at noon Korea time. Thank you.